Hello, uh, my name is Marv Geller, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all today to what promises to be a fascinating afternoon all around a common theme of numerical uh, modeling of the ocean and atmosphere, sort of a historical perspective. And um, there's a very good session coming up after this Bergness lecture. And I should point out on the left-hand screen, tonight at 6.15, there's going to be a special presentation on the Global Weather Service in 2025, which will be a multimedia laser light show by uh, Dr. Richard Anthes of UCAR. And so not only will we do a historical perspective, but there'll be a projection into the future. So the AGU and the, the sections of the AGU have two named lectures per year. And at the fall meeting, the named lecture is the Berkness Lecture. And this year, I'm happy that we have the speaker, Dr. Eugenia Kalne. And her talk actually will lead us very nicely into the topic of the day. Dr. Kalne is a distinguished atmospheric scientist who has been on the faculty of MIT, worked at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, University of Oklahoma, has also she was she was played a very pivotal role in developing new techniques for National Center of Environmental Prediction. And now her many talents have summoned her to lead the uh, University of Maryland Atmospheric Sciences to uh, renewed greatness. And uh, Eugenia has uh, done work on modeling the atmospheres of Venus and certainly the atmosphere of the Earth, including uh, fundamental research, but also translating this fundamental research into uh, better operations by the United States and elsewhere, and many techniques that she's pioneered have uh, found their way into operations, benefiting our um, the, Amer the United States uh, predictive capability in weather. Well, today she's going to be delivering the Berkness Lecture, and her title is Global Weather Forecasting in the Last Two Decades. Eugenia. I couldn't sleep last night uh, uh, because Marvin Geller was, is, was my, my boss and so was Bill Bonner. And I got so nervous thinking about this talk that I had uh, nightmares, thank you, about getting a, a very bad and deservedly bad uh, performance appraisal from, and from them and from Jon Snow, also my former boss. So, uh, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a little bit more <coughs> uh, numerical weather and climate prediction over the last uh, two decades. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to start talking, uh, quoting Linus Pauling uh, about the elder and younger Bjergnes. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the evolution of the observing system and the, and the forecast skill, which, <coughs> which uh, clearly has improved over, over, over the, the last uh, decades. And I'm going to ask the question whether the, uh, this improvement is due to the observing system or to the numerical weather prediction science, and, and try to answer that uh, using the reanalysis, which is going back to, to the old data for, for 50, the last 50 years, uh, and or then I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, st 
storms of the century that took place in, in the 1950s, reforecasted using this reanalysis. Then I'm, I'm going to talk about the, uh, how already what we were dreaming would be the future has arrived. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about ensembles and, and how they contribute to, to a, a, an assessment of the forecast uh, reliability and how uh, they will contribute to adaptive observations and, and assessing the system's errors. And uh, briefly talk about the second initial condition problem uh, uh, related to atmospheric modeling, uh, climate prediction, uh, and this is going to uh, be very brief uh, uh, due to SSTs and soil moisture and uh, or other, other, and talk about the future. And I would like to, I am at, at the University of Maryland, and, uh, but I would like very much uh, to express my my deep gratitude to uh, NSEP and to the University of Oklahoma and to NASA, uh, where I was very lucky to, to be working and, and learning and from my colleagues. And so let me, let me start with this thing about the elder and younger Bjergnes. Uh, the elder Bjergnes, uh, according uh, to what Linus Pauling uh, with, you will see, was uh, Wilhelm Bjergnes who in, had a tremendous impact on, on numerical weather prediction since he was the first person that in 1904 uh, po uh, pointed out that, that the equations of, that govern the evolution of the atmosphere could be are a complete set of equations and we could in principle uh, predict them doing what we call numerical weather prediction. The younger Vietnamese, his son uh, Jacob, had a, also a tremendous impact on, on the <coughs> understanding of the coupling of, of the atmosphere and the, and the ocean in the southern oscillation, and uh, have, has led to, to probably to the prediction of El Nino that we take for granted nowadays. So, uh, if in 1990, uh, I'll, I'll tell a personal uh, anecdote here uh, uh, for a minute. In 1990, I read a, a, an article uh, in a new health newsletter that indicated that uh, vitamin C has no effect on colds. And I got mad because I know myself that it has helped me to get rid of, of, of uh, bronchitis that I used to get every winter. So I wrote an angry letter to this uh, health newsletter, and at, at that time I thought Linus Pauling must be long dead, but just in case I sent a copy of the letter to, to Stanford University, where he used to, to work many years before. And to my <laughs> surprise and delight, a, a, a few, a couple of weeks later, I got a, 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 an autographed copy of, of this uh, uh, very nice book, How to Live Longer and Feel Better by, by Linus Pauling. And a wonderful letter uh, came also that, uh, by him in which he, <coughs> he was at that time uh, about 90 years old. And he uh, pointed out that he, had, he was still doing experiments on, on vitamin C and, and, and getting people to, to live longer. And, but then he ended this, this letter with this incredible quote. Uh, yeah, it says, I, in my own letter I had pointed out that I was an atmospheric science. <laughs> so he said that he attended lectures uh, about 66 years ago, I attended lectures on meteorology by both the elder and the younger Bjergnes. I was not attracted into the field, however. <laughs> So this, this happened in 1924, and I, I think it's probably the worst failure that the younger and the older Bjergnes has <laughs> not to be able. <coughs> so the numerical weather prediction in the last uh, decades has, has really uh, been based on, on the idea of data assimilation. And uh, 
probably all of you know what it is, but let me just very quickly uh, repeat what it is. <coughs> there will be... The, uh, Roger Daly will give uh, another uh, talk about this in more detail, but let me just quickly mention the uh, data assimilation or analysis uh, <coughs> is, is, is based on having a, a model like an atmospheric model, for example, a global model, and another uh, method for, to interpolate statistically uh, two types of data. So the, the statistical interpolation produces initial conditions for the model. The model produces, uh, is used to make a short forecast, and this forecast is used as a first case and combined with new observations. And uh, the, this is called four-dimensional data simulation because the model introduces uh, uh, the time dimension, and the model transports information in space and in time. And the 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 improvements in, in numerical weather prediction then depend on, on these three components, the model, the analysis or, or statistical interpolation and the, obser and the observations. So we would like to know, among other things, uh, we, when we improve things, what, what produced the improvement. This is the longest verification uh, that we have of, of forecasts. And <coughs> It was started at, at NMC, which is now called ENSEP, and it's for 500 milliwatts uh, uh, in the middle of the atmosphere, and it's the relative error in the pressure gradient, and it, it was calibrated with humans so that a, a perfect forecast was uh, uh, found to be about 20% uh, relative error comparing uh, skilled analyst, analysts, analysis of, of very good data. And you can see, and uh, 70 corresponds to a, a useless forecast. And you can see that, indeed, we've been improving. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, in the last few years, it's reaching the 36-hour forecast. It's reaching uh, almost a uh, perception. But, but of course, the 24-hour forecast is even better. Uh, then another point is that the 72-hour forecast was started much later because it was useless before, and, and now it's at the same level that, that the 36-hour forecast was there. So the question is, uh, is, is this due to, to, the, to the science of, of, of numerical weather prediction, which is perhaps these two uh, uh, methods for interpolation and the model, or, or to the observing system? And the, the, this is a, a depiction of more or less a current 1997 observing system from, from the current time. And <coughs> I'll use it as analog mode. The, uh, what we see here is the Ray Winson distribution of observations which is the backbone of the observing system, and then uh, aircraft winds and temperatures and, and satellite uh, measurements of radiance, which measure temperature and, and winds, and then surface observations over land and over ocean. In 1948, the observing system started the, uh, the upper air Oh, it came back. Uh, the upper air network uh, for the northern hemisphere started in, in uh, around 1948, uh, uh, and you can see that there were good observations, in, in a good density of observations in over, over the U.S. and uh, uh, Alaska and, and India and some other places, but not much elsewhere. In uh, ten years later, uh, associated with the uh, International Geophysical Year, the, the observing system in, increased a lot, actually decreased over the U.S. and, and over, over China, it's just amazing. <laughs> and uh, in the southern hemisphere, we started having a lot of observations, and, and actually it hasn't changed too much since then, 
and in some areas like the former Soviet Union, it has gotten worse. Uh, it, so, but this uh, Ray Winson network, which is the, the again the backbone of the of the uh, observing system, is uh, as you can see over over the oceans very very poor. The, this actually uh, is the total number of observations that were used in a reanalysis uh, going back to 1948, including surface and upper air observations. And, and you can see that in the southern hemisphere, there was almost nothing until the, the, the even, even including surface observations, there was very little until the, the geophysical year. Then uh, we've been increasing, uh, and it's only after the advent of, of uh, routine operational satellite data that we have a very much better observing system, uh, more complete observing system. So let me go back a little bit to, to the evolution of skill, and then we'll compare the effect of, of the science in numerical weather prediction versus the ob observations. This, for, this is the mean sea level pressure uh, forecast, again, for 36 hours, and uh, it's actually worse than, than at the upper levels. Uh, we are still far from, from perfection. This is 30% uh, and it's 20% that, that's visually a perfect forecast. And uh, it's, again, interesting that the 72-hour the forecast was useless. At, uh, uh, at least at NMC uh, in, the, in the 1980s. And it's interesting that these are uh, models that were frozen, so since they were not developed, they, they don't improve with time. Now, uh, the, we've, we've seen a, a doubling in, in skill, at least uh, over the last decade or two, and contrary to a perception that I've seen said by many people, it, uh, the, the, the doubling is also true for, for precipitation. For example, if we compare the, the two-day forecast of precipitation uh, measured by a threat score by human forecasters is, is as good as, as the one-day forecast was about uh, five or ten years ago, and the improvement in the last few years is, is due to, to models, and uh, this is actually true also over the U.S. Uh, for example, the ETA model is twice, the two-day forecast is just uh, as good as the NGM forecast was, was when it was frozen. This is a, another measure uh, of, of uh, the, the evolution of the errors, which is the fit of the six-hour forecast, which is used as a first guess against observations. And you can see that in the southern hemisphere it was hopeless and in the northern hemisphere, it was about 30 meters, and now uh, uh, we are close to 15 meters, which is not too far from the observational error. And uh, one last uh, comment about the, the operational forecast. This is a comparison uh, based on, uh, made by Frank Hughes, who uh, was developing his own verification and unfortunately died in 1986. But it, it's a very interesting, uh, the oldest verification of medium range forecast it starts in the 1970s. And you can see that uh, uh, maybe after 1976, the three day forecast started to, to increase with time, which shows skill. And uh, this happened in 1979 or so for the glo uh, five day forecast. And the humans are always better than, than the. Uh, numerical guidance. So the, there is, this is always true. The, the humans uh, provide value added to the forecast, but it's very clear that the driving of the improvement comes from the numerical guidance. So uh, now we ask the question, is the, the improvement in the forecast due to the observing system or, or to the science of numerical weather prediction and computers? And the answer is both, but, but uh, uh, going, we, we went back uh, to, to actually 1948, and, and this is a, the, is a measure of the skill, which is called anomaly correlation for uh, uh, 
from 1958 to the present, and <clears throat> the slope, this was done with the, the analysis system, which is uh, uh, frozen, so it, and it's a 1994 uh, state-of-the-art system. So we can see that, that the improvements that we see here are due to the, to the uh, improvements in the observing system, whereas the, the improvement in, in the operational system is, is much, much larger because uh, we, we've gone so far. Uh, this this is, shows the same thing for the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and uh, it is clear that, that the improvement in the observing system in the southern hemisphere had a much larger impact with time than, than in the northern hemisphere. Now, if we go back to 1948, when we hardly had any, we had hardly had any observations this is, this is 1958, and in the 1948, what, uh, uh, the southern hemisphere scores were almost perfect at, at this time. Uh, the reason for this uh, apparently ridiculous result is, is that there were no observations at this time. So when, when we do uh, compare the, the forecast to the analysis, and the analysis is based on on a forecast and data, and there is no data, then the analysis is the same as the forecast. Uh, you can see that in the northern hemisphere, uh, where there already there were observations, the, the forecast seemed to be lousy. However, uh, the, we, we went back, uh, and this is uh, courtesy of, of uh, uh, my colleagues at NCEP, uh, uh, in particular, Bob Kiesler, we went back and, and looked at, at some uh, forecasts even before 1958, even before the, the big improvement due to uh, the International Geophysical Year. And this, this is a forecast, uh, a reanalysis for uh, tw the 22nd of uh, November in 1950, uh, and in, on Thanksgiving, on, on the 26th of, for, of this year, there was an incredible, probably the worst storm of the century. <coughs> there were several storms of the century, but this, this was probably the most famous of them. And uh, let me quickly describe uh, what the reanalysis says that happened. Uh, there, there was a, a, a rather weak low associated with a very, very cold uh, air, uh, air mass over Canada, uh, minus 30 degrees almost uh, in, in this area, and uh, this evolved. The, the cold air came, came down and, and the low evolved uh, rather unthreatening here, and then the, the following day it developed somewhat and, and uh, it, it's associated with a very, very cold. Uh, center with cyclonic vorticity at 850 millibars, and then the following, sorry, the following day the, uh, the low deepened and it seemed to be moving offshore, and then boom, it, it uh, exploded and, and produced this in, incredible uh, storm with, with a very cold uh, vortex here. And this storm was was uh, used by, by Chani after uh, he, he had done the parotropic experiments for the first time. He did, uh, and his colleagues did, did a, a paroclinic forecast and were able to predict a, a, a one-day intensification of the storm, and this was the impetus, this storm was the impetus for, for uh, creating the joint unit for uh, weather prediction that, that, that started uh, operational numerical weather prediction. Sorry. Uh, so the so this was the the verification time, and at that time, before 1958, uh, the 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 were sent at three three and and fifteen z. So we made a, a three-day forecast with with. With it for this storm, and actually it is quite good, and, and it gave a lot of precipitation and has a cold center. 
quite reasonable. Uh, and certainly the 24-hour forecast and the, the, the two-day forecast was very good, but even the, the four-day forecast gave a, 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 a very decent uh, uh, forecast. And if you compare the, the 500 millibar height, it's, it's quite remarkable that, that it, it can uh, reproduce that, that evolution. Sorry. So, uh, and another example of, of uh, even the five-day forecast is, is uh, not too bad, although it has the, the low in, in uh, shifted, but it, it certainly indicated that there was going to be a bomb there. Uh, and another example of, of such a, a, a sorry, maybe I'll keep it like this. Uh, <clears throat> this should say 1953, not, not 50, but. Uh, another example of, of uh, a tremendous storm that, that uh, made history in and, and numerical weather prediction is uh, a, a storm, a North Sea gale of, of February, February 1953, and uh, the reanalysis shows that, that there were uh, indeed tremendous winds uh, 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 coming from from the North Sea into land, uh, and the, the, it shows speeds of uh, up to 50 or 55 knots. This is work of Van den Dulle et al. Uh, the, the forecast show uh, an e excellent one-day forecast and so on, but, but actually it's, it's quite amazing that given the, the little data that was available at that time, the <clears throat> the forecasts were, were excellent. This is a, the reanalysis showing the sea level pressure with, with this incredibly strong gradient here. And I should say when, when I presented uh, this result at, at the reanalysis conference uh, workshop, in term, multiple reanalysis workshop in, in uh, this summer after my talk, Several people came after and said, I knew immediately what you were talking about because my, the roof of my house blew away or, or uh, there, there were thousands of people that, that died. Uh, anyway, the, the one day forecast was uh, from the re, re forecast from the reanalysis is, is excellent and so is the, the, the two day forecast and uh, showing this, this very strong gradient and the three-day forecast is, is also excellent and, and so is almost the, the, the four-day forecast is almost as good although the, the, the location of the low is a little bit shifted and the gradient is not as strong. It's only the five-day forecast that, that, sh that fails to, to show a strong gradient. So uh, we, it turns out that these two uh, tremendous storms that, that people remember and that led to, to developments in meteorology uh, were actually highly predictable, even with, with that uh, system of, of observing system, which was very, very uh, sparse. So uh, nowadays, actually, we, we have developed a, a method which we call ensemble forecasting, of which uh, Professor List will talk more and, and which he, he started in the community. The, and and the, very schematically, the idea is to make a, 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 a several forecasts rather than a single one and, and uh, uh, use them to, to check the reliability and, and, uh, of the forecast. So, uh, very, very uh, uh, simply, uh, the basic requirement for ensemble forecasting, which by now has become a, a routine and essential component of numerical weather prediction is that that the <coughs> that the ensemble should 
generally encompass the truth so that the, what, what actually happens looks like one ensemble member. So before we used to have a single control forecast and now we have a, a whole ensemble and, and the, the truth should, should look like, um, uh, in an ideal ensemble, it should look like, like one of the members. And actually, uh, if, if we get something like this, in which the, the, the truth is over here, over there, and, and the, the ensembles <coughs> and the control are somewhere else, this is really not very good. But if I have time, I'll show you that actually, even in this case, we can make good use of this uh, information because it tells us that the problem is not with the initial conditions, but but with the systematic problem of the system. So we, uh, 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 both at, at ECMWF and at NCEP, uh, we we started doing operational ensemble forecasting, and one uh, in 1992, and uh, in one method that we used to to present the results is to, to show a single, to show many forecasts, but a single contour line for, for all of them, like, uh, so that you can see, for example, where, where the system locates that. This is in order to facilitate the understanding of, of, of the results. And this is, uh, in 1994, we started doing 17 forecasts per day. And this was actually the first uh, uh, storm of uh, a winter storm of the east coast of that, that year. And the five day and actually the six day, which I don't have here, were showed very good agreement. Uh, you can see that all the forecasts are, are locating the form storm here. So it's, uh, uh, to me, it's <laughs> surprising because I would have thought that uh, the, the development of, of instability like uh, uh, a storm should be associated with larger error growth than normal, but clearly the ensembles know better and, and indicate the, that, that the forecast is very reliable. And, and actually, this was the first time that the forecasters went with the more than the five days long forecast with, with the confidence. But this is a, a, the opposite example, and it happened a couple of weeks earlier. This is an example in which the, the in which the, the forecast show a tremendous lack of predictability for this storm, which I would show if I could. Uh, uh, the, 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 it's not clear whether the storm is going to be here or here, and actually the verification is somewhere in, in between. So at least the forecasters knew beforehand that, that this would happen. And maybe I'll, I'll keep this. Uh, so, going back to, to an extreme, we, 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 this is the, the same plot for, for uh, an 11-day forecast, 10 and a half an 11-day forecast, and clearly it shows the, that the spaghetti plot is, is completely mixed <laughs> and, and that there is no spill. It's what, what uh, we know as chaos now, and the la black line is the verification. But uh, this is a, it's not surprising because it's an 11 days uh, long forecast and that's way beyond what we expected to do before. But th this is uh, another example two weeks later showing also uh, uh, an 11 day forecast. And you can see that, that in this case the atmosphere, the ensemble indicates that the atmosphere is very predictable and that the verification indeed agrees with the location of the large-scale uh, ridges and, and trough. And finally, uh, going to the, the shortest range, this is a 12-hour forecast, and after 12 hours, we should have a very, very good agreement, and we do have it in, in some areas, but in this case, you can see that, that there is a, a a lot of uncertainty, for example, in, in this area, which the following day evolved into 12 hours, uh, I mean, 24 hours later, that the 12-hour forecast showed a, a tremendous uncertainty here. And this actually brings an, in, uh, the, a new idea, which 
which has also sprung in the last few years and, and it's taking off uh, like mad, which is the idea of adaptive observations. It's obvious that if we could, we should put more observations here, we don't need them uh, uh, so, so badly in, in other places. So uh, we could have an observing system which is adaptive. And in this case, uh, for example, we have a, a, a two and a half day forecast that indicates uh, such a lack of, <coughs> and set of or lack of predictability for this forecast. We, we don't know where the storm is going to be, but because it's a, we still have two and a half days, we can, uh, in the next, uh, uh, we can determine or try to determine where the instability is coming from and then uh, put observations in the, in where, where it came from. And, and recently this has been tested in several experiments, one in FASTEC, one in the North Pacific Ocean, uh, rather successfully. So now there are several methods to, to determine where this instability originates, like 12 hours from now, where, where is this instability going to be, so we can put more observations. So, uh, as I mentioned before, if you are in the <coughs> I've shown examples which are nice examples like, like this uh, in which the, the truth looks like one member of the ensemble, but sometimes you, you may find that, that you are in a situation like this uh, and in which the, the truth clearly is not like a member of the ensemble. The ensemble is close together, but, but the truth is somewhere else. And uh, we can, even in that case, uh, use the information of the ensemble. And this is a, a very nice result, uh, uh, example of this uh, that was provided by, by uh, Jim Kinter of COLA. <coughs> and it shows another storm of the century which took place in January 1996 when, when the government in in Washington DC was closed after having been closed by Congress for a couple of months. And uh, it was a tremendous snowstorm and the, the, the first figure here shows in green the verification and, and in black the ensemble average uh, after a one day forecast and after a two day forecast. The, the, there is a loss of skill and uh, smoothing because, of course, the, the ensemble members spread. And this is the, the error, and this is the ensemble standard deviation. So it's two millibars here, and, and then uh, five millibars, and then eight millibars, and ten millibars, and, and you expect that, that there would be. And then we go to, to day five, and, and we see that the, something horrible has happened. The, the forecast is completely wrong. The verification still is in green and it shows a, a high pressure instead of a low. The error is huge and the ensemble is, has excellent agreement with each other. So something is, is really wrong with that. But again, if we are in this situation, we can, <coughs> we, we can use that information to, to to try to see what, what's wrong with the, with the system itself. And, and that's what uh, uh, Tim Kinter and, and his colleagues did. Uh, they saw that, that the, the, the development of the, <coughs> the system was rather similar to the storm of 1950 in which uh, a cold uh, uh, air mass in, in Canada descended uh, uh, and as a center of high pressure and to the, and to the east coast, to the east of, of it, de developed this, this uh, uh, storm. And the forecast uh, was correct for This was due to, to the snow cover. The snow cover uh, for the forecast uh, from 
the last day and the, day, the, the days before were okay, but well, actually there was a weekly snow cover, but then the forecast made from, from the day that instead of predicting a, a low, predicted a high, the snow cover was missing in, in the initial conditions, and that had something to do with the fact that, that it was crossing the year. It was not the year 2000, but still uh, we had problems with our system when going over, over a year, and, and that, of course, has been corrected since then. But it's a very nice example that without the ensemble, one couldn't uh, tell whether the, the forecast is wrong for, for, for just bad luck or, or, or it's wrong because of the system. Now, I, I'd like to say a few words of, about the extension of these forecasting uh, methods to, as an initial value problem to to climate system, and, and I took from the web, both from the European Centre and from NCEP, uh, recent forecasts, because I, I think it's just almost like a miracle that in recent years we've made so much progress that, that we routinely uh, dare to make forecasts going uh, into uh, several months and even uh, seasonal and interannual. I remember vividly when we had long discussions when Bill Bonner was the director of NMC and, and uh, there were, we were meeting with other people that wanted to do this and I remember Max Suarez saying, well, NCEP should either do it or, allow, <laughs> or uh, somebody, some, somebody and, and hopefully several groups should, should be doing experimental forecasting based on, on El Niño predictions. And now they are made routinely, and uh, I think uh, Hans Litma may, may say much more about this, but it's rather amazing that we have, for example, a, a two and a half months forecast, and the, it predicts uh, both uh, temperature and precipitation, and, and the, the predictions are, are posed in a very sophisticated way, above normal, below normal, and normal and also uh, in a very sincere way that I think was started by, by Hugh Van den Dulen and his colleagues, it, it also indicates no knowledge, so it's climatology. So it's, it's difficult for many people to understand, but in this case the probability of being normal is more than, than, than the normal of 33%. So and similarly, the European Centre in, in their web have examples of, of uh, uh, seasonal or monthly uh, seasonal prediction, and this is a seasonal prediction of the, the sea surface temperature, no, the, the, the air temperature ano anomalies uh, based on, on their ensemble system, and uh, this is plotted for the tropics, and the tropics have a lot of predictability, much more than the mid-latitudes. And actually, the, the, both centers are, are doing uh, predictions for El Niño. We are currently on La Niña system, and because we are doing this data simulation for, for both the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, we are being able to, to predict, uh, as well as statistically, we are able to predict the, the evolution of the ni El Niño, La Niña, in, in this case. And in this case, uh, both the, the European Centre is predicting that, that it's sort of going to become uh, normal or, or disappear, the, uh, the cold episode in March or April of the year 2000, and the NCEP system is actually predicting the same, the same thing, that, that by March of, or, or of, of 19... Uh, of, of the year 2000, next year it, 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 it's going to cross the normal situation. Uh, and this is an old, uh, an old uh, uh, result from Ming Ji of offensive, but it's really amazing. He compares the correlation of predicting El Niño sea surface temperature anomalies uh, up to 12 months in advance and he compares two, two uh, 
as we always do in numerical, in operational forecasting, this is the old system and this is the new system and of course it's, it's better. But this was the same without doing uh, data simulation except for the surface temperature, without using like uh, 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 XPTs and, and I think altimeters. So the, it's very clear from this result that data simulation in the ocean has also had a tremendous effect. And also, I would like to mention that, that climate prediction is going to make progress also as, uh, uh, through, through our coupling the, the land surface. And one example is the, the soil moisture. Actually, uh, I, I was in Oklahoma in, 1980, in 1998 in the summer, and we had this incredible uh, drought and, and persistent heat wave of, of the summer of 1998, and this is for May, June, and July, and, and uh, uh, you can see that there was essentially no precipitation. Uh, we made a study that, that shows that, that during May, the, the drought was established due to sea surface temperature anomalies. But after, after May, it was maintained through, through a, a, a positive feedback of the, of the fact that the soil was very dry and, and that maintained it. And actually, the medium range forecast of the, uh, the NSEP system, which, which is in the, the ensemble, which is integrated to, to, to 15 days, uh, felt this because. The, the, there was no rain in all those 15 days for, and, uh, for a long time. So uh, I will uh, basically uh, uh, finish. <laughs> and I'll, I, I think uh, we are already in the future that we've done, uh, there are so, so many new things that have happened that, that uh, uh, <coughs> in, in the last two decades, that, that, that's really a, a pleasure to look at. <laughs> one, one is, for example, the use of ensembles is allowing us to, to go much further. It, uh, as I showed, there are cases in which you can make a prediction and that lasts 10 or, or 12 days, and this is happening no, not infrequently uh, uh, nowadays, and, and we know when it happens. And actually, we have some cases in which the, the forecast remained every day above 70% uh, anomaly correlation, which is quite high for, for two weeks. Of course, that doesn't mean that the weather will continue to be predictable, but if we can, if we can predict occasionally much longer, and we know when we can predict it, and, and occasionally m the forecasts are much worse, but we know when they are worse, and, and perhaps we can do uh, adaptive observations, there is a lot of, of room for that. We, uh, the, as, uh, I'm, uh, we will see much more. This initial value of uh, problem has been now extended to the coupled ocean atmosphere, which has oscillations which are also random, like uh, ENSO oscillations, but whose period is much longer, so they remain predictable much longer. So this has led to operational, seasonal, to interannual predictions. And also, I should say, when you look at the, the for example, the NCEP, uh, CPC website, the, you, you can also see how well or badly the, the system has done uh, routinely. Now, an, another area where, where we are in the future and, and where we, there's going to be much more evolution is environmental data simulation for, for monitoring and prediction. I think uh, data simulation has become a, a tremendous tool for, for the future. And this, <coughs> this uh, for example, now we are starting to do uh, in, data simulation for the coupled ocean atmosphere and, and land system. And uh, we, with, uh, what, what used to be noise is now part of the signal. For example, clouds, aerosols, ocean waves are, are uh, part of, of the signal. And we, we have to do uh, this environmental data simulation for 
both prediction and monitoring. And uh, hopefully, someday we will have uh, uh, in, an integrated uh, hydrology and river flow prediction as part of the system. And actually, I should have uh, put, uh, I forgot to write it down, but uh, another area where where there has to be a lot of progress and it's only starting is atmospheric chemistry and, and pollution and uh, is estimation of, of uh, transports of, of uh, pollutants by, by rivers and by, by the atmosphere. Another area w is where, where there is a tremendous uh, uh, progress going on is uh, mul multi uh, multi <coughs> sorry uh, storm scale prediction where the University of Oklahoma has taken a, a lead in, in 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 using radar data and other data for 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 predicting observations and someday we will have very very uh, reliable short range forecast we are starting to have them another is multi-system ensembles. <coughs> uh, there is a, a paper in, in science that, that uh, Professor Krishnamurti has uh, developed. Uh, 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 he, he showed that using a multi-system uh, and actually correcting for systematic errors but, uh, uh, and doing uh, regression gives forecasts that are very, very good. And actually the, the fact that the, sorry. the fact that that uh, oops, that multi systems uh, result in much better ensemble uh, ensembles than, than, than either than any particular center can develop alone is something that's actually pervasive and, and, and very important and we should make uh, 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 exploit it. And this is an example of, of a mesoscale experiment, storm and mesoscale experiment of May 1998, 1998 uh, where there were four uh, uh, organizations that participated with, with uh, uh, four different models and, and we all did ensemble forecasting and it shows that in the individual uh, systems had errors which were uh, uh, sort of comparable but, but the ensemble average and even the ensemble of the four controls uh, was by much, much better and this is something pervasive that we have observed with global and, and regional systems, and perhaps it's not surprising because an ensemble should sample the uncertainty in the initial conditions, the errors in the, should, should have perturbations in the initial conditions as, as first pointed out by, by Professor Leith, that the perturbations should be representative of the uncertainties in the initial conditions and also the, the models should have perturbations that are uh, uh, representative of our uncertainty in the models. And when we do, when we do a multi-system like this, then uh, by definition, each group is trying, or each operational center is trying their very best to, to be the best. So the initial conditions are different, showing uncertainties that that are state-of-the-art uncertainties, and each of them is trying to develop the best possible model, and so the, the difference among the models is also a state-of-the-art estimation of the true uncertainty that, that we have. And it, perhaps it's not surprising that, that the um, multi-system works so well. So, uh, and maybe, uh, I should have said when we talked about <laughs> when I talked about uh, the chemistry of the atmosphere and pollution that actually I'm very proud that the University of Maryland is is taking the lead in, in predicting ozone and the red alerts that we have in the, the
the DC area and in the eastern area come come from our department. And I'm, I'm very impressed with that. Uh, the, finally, I'll, I'll mention new observing systems and again adaptive observation. Satellites may be able to to look when when the data simulation system tells and the ensemble says that there is uncertainty there, the satellites may be able to look more. And then advanced infrared and microwave instruments and, and LIDAR wings, which I think uh, the day we, we get LIDAR wings, we probably will reach a perfection as, as far as we can in numerical weather prediction because the winds are so important. And same with do, dual Doppler radars for, for regional modeling. Thank you.